Hello and welcome to Inside the Game, our weekly show here on Sky Sports, where we look at the big issues and the main talking points from the world of Gaelic games. If you'd like to get in touch with us on social media, you can find us on the hashtag Sky Sports GEA. Later on in the show, we'll be hearing from Monaghan three-time all-star Conor McManus. And as usual on our football show, we're joined by our regular pundits, Kerry's Kieran Donaghy and Peter Canavan from Tyrone. Lads, you're both very welcome to the show. Peter, there's one obvious place to start this week, and that's with the great news that it's official. The 2020 Championships will go ahead. How important was it that we got the announcement last weekend, the official announcement for the government and from the GEA, that the show would go on? Yeah, it was very important to have something definitive. Um, I think inter-county players were very much in limbo, as were inter-county managers and su- supporters alike. So uh, to get that news was uh, was good, was a very positive uh, step forward. But the challenge now is, can we replicate what has to date been a fantastic club championship uh, across the country, the quality of fair, some of the matches, and thankfully we've got a, a chance to see a lot of the, the club games. That has been that has been brilliant. But the challenge now is, can we replicate that at, at uh, county level? And uh, if we can, we're going to be in for a fantastic championship. Kieran, just to remind ourselves of that statement released over the weekend, it underlined the fact that this championship could not go ahead without the financial support of the government. They have agreed to come on board and significantly support the uh, the cost of the 2020 championships. It really does remind us, doesn't it, that this is now a, a high money, a, a big state uh, championship that needs that sort of support. Yeah, look, it's it's um, the GEA is, is amateur as in the organisation, but the cost uh, is is massive to, to run teams, to train teams, to give your team the best chance to try and deliver and win trophies for them and it's it's brilliant that the government because as we know we're in a global pandemic there's a lot of strain put on the government as of now with, with outgoing so it's great that they've stepped up to the mark they know how insp- important sport is for this country uh, in particular they know how important the GEA is for this country uh, and for us to get through the winter it's absolutely fantastic that we have this football to look forward to and, uh, and credit must go to them for stepping up and helping because I'm sure there's lots of county teams that couldn't field uh, couldn't couldn't get a, a good team out there. Couldn't uh, afford the the nutritionist, the, the strength and conditioning coach, and therefore massively hampering their chances of going forward and winning something. So it's great that everybody will be on a le- level playing field, the same amount of trainings, and getting a bit of support from the government and being able to put their best foot forward and, and try and deliver, uh, which is going to be a very interesting championship for everybody because it's not going football. Uh, it's played in winter, so you could get banana skins, you could get big upsets. Uh, and let's hope we see plenty of that for the summer or for the winter ahead. And then, of course, we had a couple of days to digest that news. And along comes another announcement yesterday, the government revealing their roadmap for living with COVID for the months ahead. And in terms of the big news lines for sports fans and for GA fans in particular, the news that for stadiums with a capacity of over 5,000, 200 fans will be allowed in from this week. But crucially, if you're living in the capital, that 200 number does not apply just now due to the high case levels of COVID-19 in and around the city. And then you've got that uh, anomaly as such with up to 400 fans currently attending GA matches in Northern Ireland. And Peter, I know living in Tyrone, You've been at quite a few uh, club championship games over the last number of weeks and months. Tell us, what's it been like up there where you're going to games along with 399 other people while knowing just a few miles over the road across the border, nobody allowed in to watch games now for, for weeks and weeks and weeks? It's been unbelievable. and I'm amazed at that statement. I'm very disappointed with the Irish government because I think at this stage, uh, things have moved on. And if you recall, Mike, at the very start of the, the crisis, it was the GAA that uh, were to the fore in terms of leadership. They were very decisive. And it was their lead, not only to their own members, but across um, the country, everybody followed suit and, and realised the seriousness. Pitches was closed. Walkways around pitches weren't even used. So 
they showed great leadership then. And I think since that, things have moved on somewhat. The, the GAA, in my opinion, still have the finger on the pulse. And with at least 400 supporters up here in recent weeks, um, there's been no issues. It hasn't ex exacerbated the problem at all. So in my opinion, I was expecting uh, in the roadmap something like seven or 800 supporters now to be going to, to games because not only that, but the, there's a lot of inter-county finals coming up. And the fact that there's only 200 at it, you know, it means that uh, there's a greater chance now, of bigger numbers, watching the game indoors and uh, if anything, you know, leading uh, to, the, to the, the numbers going up. So very disappointed. Um, I know the GA of, of, or the Irish government have you know made a few steps forward, but that's a big step back in my opinion. Kieran, just a couple of days ago, you played in a county final down in Kerry, in front of an empty stadium. Tell us what was that whole experience like, and what do you make of this announcement that if it be played next weekend, two hundred people could be in there? Yeah, like you know, I'm I'm, I'm with Peter on this. It's disappointing. Um, you know, you've a, you've a stadium uh, of five thousand people uh, that can only be allowed two hundred into it, but you've a, a club, a normal club ground that mightn't be, might only be able to hold two or three hundred, and you're allowed a hundred into that. So the division doesn't make sense in it. Um, like Peter, you know, there is a lot of county finals coming up. There's a lot more than two or four hundred that want to get into it. I don't understand why the government haven't come along and said, look, listen. Everybody that goes to the game must have a mask on, uh, must have a mask on for the duration of the game. If you're caught without a mask on, the stewards can remove you from the pitch. Um, it would keep a lot of the loud mouths quiet, which would be no harm, Mike. Uh, but I think everybody else, I think everybody else, it would keep everybody safe uh, and it would allow more numbers into these games. We're allowed going to supermarkets with our masks on indoors, you know, and as Peter rightly said, you're going to have more people now in pubs, booking meals. Uh, pubs are open again, watching it on screens, indoors. Uh, and, I, and I think there'll be, be a lot safer if people were outside with masks on. Uh, a lot of these county finals are on in the provincial ground. So there's big stadiums, 6, 8, 10, 15, 20,000 seater stadiums. I'm sure there's more than two and 400 should be allowed in. I think we should be trying to get that up and get it up fast. But again, the proviso is make sure everybody has um, a mask on, I would say, would be a crucial part. Peter, just to, to hop a ball in your direction here, but if the case numbers were to stay as they are and the current protocols and guidelines don't change in relation to spectators being allowed in to, to GA matches, would it be worthwhile looking at the possibility of bringing some of the bigger games, be they club or county, to Ulster, where literally twice as many people could go and watch them. Is that a realistic possibility? I, I don't think so. That's how farcical the situation is where that could, you know, potentially happen. Um, but I, I wouldn't like to see it. Uh, I wouldn't like to see it go down that road. And, and I do believe in, in a matter of weeks that the government will move on. Maybe they'll see that by allowing 200 supporters and, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's nothing really. And, and, you know, Kieran was talking about masks. There's not much space around the ground. People will not even need, in my opinion, not to wear masks. But uh, you're quite right. That would be a part of the situation. And I hope it's one that doesn't happen. I think I think it's more the masks, though. I think the, the problem, Peter, is more people going in and, in and out of the stand rather than, than than watching the game, which is why the masks would be would be crucial. People queuing outside, waiting for the gates to open to get in. Um I think that's where their worries are more so than inside because, it, it, you know, the numbers don't make sense for that. If they, were, if they weren't too worried about inside, there surely would be more than, than 200 people out into a 5,000-seater stadium. Well, quite a few statements are released in the last uh, few days. It's, it's hard to keep up at times, but this, Peter, was a particularly interesting announcement, a statement from the FAI, the GEA and the IRFU who are working collectively to engage with public health officials and the government around the whole area of trying to get more spectators into bigger stadiums for bigger matches. That's certainly the first interpretation a lot of people have taken from that particular statement. What would your thinking be? What's the first thing you think of when you see that statement? Well, it's very good to see the main governing bodies coming together. Maybe it's something that, that should have happened earlier. Um, 
if you look in different countries, there is a bigger supporter base in some countries going uh, to games. They're following guidelines. And to date, there's been no issues. And even up here, granted, there's only been four 400 supporters allowed in. But when it's well monitored and, and uh, supporters and the people going to games know the protocol, then there will be and, and there has been no problem. So, you know, I think that's a welcome step forward. And that's planning for a few months down the line for All-Ireland semi-finals, All-Ireland finals, where hopefully we'll be fit to have a few thousand at it. Kieran, just briefly at this stage, given the, the issues Dublin have at the moment, the, the, the city and the county with COVID-19 cases, is there a possibility that we could see All-Ireland semi-finals or maybe even an All-Ireland final played outside of Pro Park? For example, if it was a Galway Kerry All-Ireland semi-final, perhaps the Gaelic grounds in Limerick could come into play? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think you can look at, I think you can definitely look at all those things because, you know, there's no point in bringing it to Crow Park if we can't get, you know, 86,000 people into it anyway. So if, if, if numbers are restricted on, on the amount of people that go to games, it does make more sense, um, uh, for that scenario to happen. Um, look, every player wants to get in Crow Park. Look, I was blessed to play there along with Peter many a time. And if, you know, if I hadn't played there yet and, and I was listening to myself, no, I'd be saying, be quiet here and we want to play in Grow Park if we get to an All-Ireland semi-final. But at the same time, it doesn't make too much sense. It depends on what the numbers are as well, Mike. It, you know, if they're talking five, ten, fifteen thousand 15,000 at games come Christmas time, which is very hard to see right now, uh, impossible probably at this stage of the game, but it all depends on that. But if not, if it's a case of very small numbers, I don't think there's a major need to be bringing that, you know, that extra amount of people into the capital that is already probably the highest numbers because of the, the highest population. But, you know, I, uh, I, I would say that, that keeping it in a Gaelic grounds or keeping it close as you can to, to provincial would be, would be a better way to go. Guys, thanks a million for jumping in and contributing on a topic and a discussion that is certainly going to run and run for the next six weeks until uh, the championship gets underway. That's it from part one of Inside the Game. We'll be back very shortly with part two. We'll be talking to three-time Monaghan All-Star and one of the county's all-time greats, Conor McManus. Join us very shortly. So welcome back to Inside the Game. Don't forget, if you'd like to get in touch with us via social media, just search for the hashtag Sky Sports GAA. Now, we're delighted to be joined in part two of the show by the three-time Monaghan All-Star, Conor McManus of Clontibret, Monaghan and Ireland. Uh, Conor, you're welcome to the show. This is a big week for you and for all the other inter-county players out there, of course. You've been busy with the club for the last few months and now we get the green light for inter-county training to begin again officially. And we've also been told that the championship will start at the end of October. There's uh, quite a bit of good for, for you there to get your head around. There is, yeah, Mike. Um, I suppose it's it's been a long time coming. We're, we've been wondering this past, you know, four or five months, will there, won't there? Um, and a lot is probably hinged on how the club season went off and and how uh, it, it unfolded and, and, you know, whether cases were coming back and whatnot. I suppose the bottom line is it's great to have something to look forward to. Yes, it's probably not the championship as we know it, how have you found playing in in club games without anybody there? Yeah, it's definitely been different. It's not how you want you, you want it to be, you know. And and the club, I suppose, you're obviously not going to have the the, the crowds that you have at inter county games, but it's still you know that you can you can hear the passion in the ground and you can hear the, the your own supporters um, when things go well or even when they don't go well. Um, but it's, it's you know that's what makes the the the, the GA and and that's I suppose we we fully appreciate that more now than than maybe ever. Connor, um, I'm really looking forward to watching you in action in a few weeks against your your neighbours down there in Cavan. But uh, I think Gales throughout the the country have been enthused by their their club championships this year, and it's fair to say the quality across the country has been exceptional. What do you attribute that to? First of all. And secondly, can that sort of quality and excitement in the club game today can that be replicated this year at under county level? Yeah, it has. It has been great. The club season, I suppose, has got a, a great window that it doesn't normally get. 
Um, the fact that a lot of games have been streamed and played live on, on TV and online and things like that, it's been great that you can just flick on on a Saturday night and watch a club game in Tyrone or watch a club game in Dublin or Kerry or wherever it may be. Um, and and it's, it's very accessible. So that's one major plus to, 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 to the whole thing. Um, but I also I'd say that the quality quality wise we've had access clubs have had access to their full panel you know they've had access to their county players and unbroken access um, to them which I think is isn't you know it's not it's not the norm you know what normally when you're coming back into your club season you're coming back off on the back of a, an inter county season you're maybe going back into a club a, cl- a club season where you're being patched up just to get through it. And bits and pieces like that. So I, I definitely think um, having having full access to the to the county players and and your full panel training together all the time can be a bonus. Now it didn't work, you know, perfectly for a lot of teams this year with COVID and everything else. Yes, but when they did get back, you know, they had they had ex- exclusive access to the players. Connor, how do you feel about the prospect of not just a winter championship, but an old school knockout championship? Obviously, you've played all your inter county football in the era of qualifiers and back doors and second chances. But not alone is this a, a do or die every day you go out. But in Monaghan's case, you start an Ulster Championship with a preliminary round derby, a local derby against Cavan. So there's going to be an awful lot at stake when that game comes around. Yeah, no doubt. And I suppose it's, it's not something that, um, that, that I've been involved in. You'd have to, you'd have to talk to... Your two, your two older statesmen here on 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 the program that, that they've been in, involved in in knockout football, but I haven't. Um, so it's it's definitely something you can look forward to. It's definitely something that um, it's it's different. And whilst you know playing Cavan in the first round of an Ulster Championship, you you don't have the crowd and you don't have the atmosphere that would come with it. Um, it's it's definitely something to look forward to all the all the all the same. Connor, can I ask you about some of the return? to play protocols that were announced uh, earlier this week as they will pertain to inter-county squads. When you look at that list, which is the one that you feel will be most challenging for you and, and for inter-county players in general? I think it's, there's, there's none of them are going to hinder us majorly. Obviously, the, the biggest one is, is dressing rooms and, and showers and things like that. They are particularly coming into the time of the year we're coming into. You know, you're coming off the training field and, and weather's not good first thing you, you do is jump into the shower and get yourself freshened up and that's that's the big thing like obviously we've been we've been restricted with the amount of sessions we can have per week and you're allowed three sessions per week and obviously panels have been cut to, cut to 32 but i think the biggest one is is the use of of dressing rooms and if if we can get use of dressing rooms which is a fairly basic requirement um i think a lot of other things will will look after themselves peter what are your impressions of, of the return to play protocols as a former player and former manager yeah, I'd have to agree with, with Connor, the point he made with, with dress rooms. That would have left things very difficult, especially coming into the autumn and, and winter months uh, playing our football. Um, and in some cases, uh, the, the fact that county teams can only meet three hours before it, um, I'd say that'll not go down well with Bonte because he likes to get sat with them, meeting them nice and early in the, in the morning there with, with Monaghan. But um, I think they're realistic. They're something that had to be addressed. And I think that if we can settle for that, I think most county teams w- would be very happy with uh, the protocols there. And Kieran, your thoughts on the uh, return to play protocols? Is there anything there that jumps out at you as it may be an issue when it comes down to it? Um, possibly looking at you know the games are going to come ticking fast, so I don't think the thirty-two is 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 a major issue. It would be if there was more trial games or in-house games and. You pick up a few injuries and then you're down to 29 and you can't play a proper game. But I think the way uh, the teams are going to be getting ready for this will be a lot of tactical stuff. Um, it'll be it'll be hard to fight your way into a team. I think it'll be kind of, you'll find it hard to get into a team unless unless there's possibly injuries because you don't get too many places to, to prove yourself only when you come off the bench. Um, but there's nothing to, as, as Connor said, look, the shower at that time of year, winter, you know, you know, in rural counties, Mike, where people have to travel an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half home, you know, it can't be realistic that a guy is going to come off a pitch in October or November in the sleets after hitting him for an hour across the side of the head and he's supposed to get into his car freezing cold and drive home. Players, you know, are I, I find it hard how they're going to stick to that because 
They're selfish human beings. That's the way you have to be. You have to look at it. Okay, I got to get into the shower. I got to get warm. Why? Because I don't want to get sick and I don't want to miss a training session. Because if you miss a training session or two training sessions with a bit of a flu, you're also, are you, are you, do you have COVID? Can you be around the group? And, and very quickly, you'll be forgotten about. So I think that's the major one that I see an issue with, with people, um, especially in rural counties that have long ways to go after training. They can't be expected to be going home an hour and a half, freezing cold in the car and, get, and getting sick on the back of it. I find I find hard to stick in with. The the water break after after 15 minutes, um, I don't think that's working. It, it breaks up the game. It's very frustrating to watch, especially when the game is, is going, flowing really well. And then for... Uh, one minute you have to completely stop and in some cases things haven't worked out uh, there's been mayhem in a couple of club games because referees restarted it but at under county level players have their own water bottles there's enough natural breaks in the game in my opinion where they can go and, and get a drink drink out of their own bottle uh, without having to slow and, and stop the game down so that was one change maybe that, that I was hoping that they would make for, for the under county games Connor, if I could ask you about the Ulster Championship this season, it's going to be played in the, the depths of winter. It's going to be a knockout championship. Obviously, we're we're all intrigued every season by what unfolds. There's so much competition. The games are are of such high quality. But then when you think about this being a knockout campaign for all involved, it's going to make it more compelling than ever, isn't it? Yeah, there's no doubt about that, Mike. Um, as a player and, and from a player's point of view, it's one that you can really look forward to. Um, you have to be at your best on, on, on the first day of the championship. That's the reality. I suppose Ulster has, you know, over the last 15, 20 years, probably been the most competitive championship around in that any one of maybe six or seven, eight, nine t- teams can win it. Um, so there's no doubt that those are championships very competitive and particularly with the, the knockout added to it this year it's just going to add that wee bit of an edge you know the probably the, the first the first team the first game that jumps off the page at you is Tyrone and Donegal you know two contenders for the All-Ireland never mind the Ulster Championship and one of them teams is going to be gone after after day one so it, it really adds an edge to, to the Ulster Championship this year I know obviously the plan Connor, is to play on for quite a few more seasons to come and hopefully win more medals more championships but if you could reflect back on your career so far 55 appearances, a couple of Ulster championships, three All-Stars as well. Could you pick out one particular moment, one particular game, one particular memory that stands out? Yeah, look, there's, 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 there's been a few over the years. Obviously, a lot, of, a lot of bad ones, but there's been some good ones as well. I suppose from, from my own personal point of view, to captain Monaghan to the Ulster Championship in 2015 was, was, was a, a personal highlight of my own. Uh, we had won it in 13 and we were beaten in the final in 14 and it was just nice to, to sort of back that up and, and get our hands back on it that, that particular day, yeah. How does it feel, Connor, watching watching that back again? You know, full house in Clonus, lovely summer's day. It must be great memories. Yeah, it feels like more, Mike. Um, you, you, you want more of it. You want more of those days. You want to get put yourself in that position again where you're competing for, for the biggest biggest prizes in, 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 in Ulster football and, and indeed in, into the All-Ireland series. Um, that, that they're, the, they're the days you train for. They're the days you want to be involved in. And obviously this year it's going to be quite different. We've already referenced that, that the, the crowd and the colour and everything won't be there. But still, they're, they're the days you want to be involved in. Peter, if I could ask you, and let's pretend Connor isn't here, when you look at his career to date, you look at his body of work, where, where does Conor McManus rank for you in the list of great Ulster and indeed forwards in general across the country? What do you expect me to say when he's beside me, um, mate? Um, it's very, very easy, very easy to answer that because um, Monaghan, um, plenty of great, talented players have come up and played for the county and played for, for good teams in Ulster, but uh, you only have to look tr- through Connor's career. I think maybe Connor, you've only missed one game, uh, championship game for your county through injury. You've been a non-stop in the team, and there's plenty of great players come and go, and they can do it over a year or two. Connor has been there for a considerable time, and he's still going really strong. So that's the the mark of the man. And when you consider that when he started playing the game, he was to the fore when there was no blanket defences. And now with blanket defences and with two or three men hanging off him 
on occasion he, he's still able to do it and he's still able to do it on the on the big stage and it is that is why Monaghan have been succe- so successful that's why they've won us their titles and this year don't be surprised to see them back again because they're in the handy side of the draw uh, and there's a good chance that they're going to be there come Ulster final day and and you could well see uh, McManus getting his hands on the anglo Celt once again Connor, we leave the last word to you we're nearly out of time how do you feel about the prospect of, of a winter championship <clears throat> as Kieran said in the, in the depths of, of the, the worst season of them all knockout football and trying to win that, that elusive All-Ireland medal yeah it's um, I think we've referenced it earlier Mike in that it's it's going to be a serious challenge. It's it's an incredibly difficult one to win. You've only one chance at it if you're if you're beaten, you're out. So it's it's one to look forward to. Um, as a player, six or five or six months ago, it looked like we were going to get no championship. So you, you know, every day you get to, to go out and and, and play in, in also championship is is a day to relish. So we're very much looking forward to getting back at it. Well, Connor, thank you very much for your time. The best of luck in Championship 2020. That's it from us on Inside the Game this week here on Sky Sports. Don't forget, we'll be back next Wednesday night at 9 o'clock with our focus on ladies football. You can also watch uh, the show back on Sky Sports Arena On Demand and also on our YouTube channel. My thanks to Kieran Donaghy and Peter Canavan, our regular Sky Sports pundits, and of course, Conor McManus, for being our special guest. That's it from us. We'll talk to you again next week. Sky Sports. Feel it all.